From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch, your beacon of truth, helping you safely navigate today's complex issues. Well, thanks for joining me. As we go beyond the headlines, engaging with national leaders and newsmakers to uncover the truth that matters most to you and your family. I'm your host, Tony Perkins, and Washington Watch starts now. If we stop weapons necessary to destroy the enemies of the state of Israel at a time of great peril, we will pay a price. This is obscene. It is absurd. Give Israel what they need to fight the war they can't afford to lose. That was South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham earlier today responding to the Biden administration holding up much needed munitions to Israel. We're going to talk about that with Alabama Senator Katie Britt. Also on Capitol Hill, lawmakers announced a measure that frankly shouldn't be necessary, but it is. We're here for the simple proposition supported by the vast majority of the American people that only citizens of the United States should vote, that we should have documentary proof that we should have a system to guarantee that only citizens of the United States vote in federal elections. That was Texas Congressman Chip Roy earlier today. Congressman Roy will join us to explain why a bill to prohibit illegal aliens from voting in federal elections is actually needed. And early this morning, D.C. Metropolitan Police made 33 arrests as they cleared out the pro-Hamas protest at George Washington University here in D.C. Over the past few days, we began to see an escalation in the volatility of the protests at GW. On Monday, MPD learned of more indicators that the protest was becoming more volatile and less stable. All of this led to my discussion and conclusion that we needed to change our posture. That was D.C. Police Chief Pamela Smith explaining why the D.C. Police moved in on the encampment today. Could be other reasons. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But not everyone, not everyone saw it the same way. This is an explicit attempt to repress students exercising their First Amendment rights to protest their university's complicitly, complicit actions in the, on behalf of Israeli government's genocide of Palestinians. That was uh, Hamas Congresswoman Rashida, Rashida Tlaib. We're going to talk with Montana Senator Steve Daines a little bit later here on Washington Watch. And as promised by House Speaker Mike Johnson, House committees are holding hearings to expose the tentacles of the anti-Semitism that is spreading throughout education. It's hard to grasp how anti-Semitism has come, become such a dominant force in our K through 12 schools. Some kids as young as second grade are spewing Nazi propaganda, which begs the question, who has positioned these young minds to attack the Jewish people? That was Florida Congressman Aaron Bean, chairman of the Early Childhood Elementary and Secondary Education Subcommittee. FRC's Meg Kilgannon will join me later with the details of today's hearing. The website, TonyPerkins.com, resources available for you there. And if you miss any of the program, it's all archived right there at TonyPerkins.com. Israel continued its limited military operation in Rafah today, conducting targeted raids in the area. The Israeli Air Force also struck more than 100 terror targets up and down the Gaza Strip, including military stations and Hamas launching areas for rockets. Now, in a Senate hearing today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin admitted the Biden administration, quote unquote, paused the delivery of additional bombs to Israel as it assesses the Rafah situation. Well, as the strains between the Biden administration and Israel become more apparent, we have to ask the question, what will this mean long term for U.S.-Israeli relations and how might this affect Israel's ongoing war against Hamas? Joining me now to discuss this and more is Senator Katie Britt from Alabama. She serves on the Senate Committee on Appropriations. Senator Britt, welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me, Tony. I really appreciate it. So, Senator, you took a trip to Israel shortly after October the 7th. You saw and assessed the situation on the ground. Uh, the situation is only intensified with Iran attacking Israel, uh, Israel having to expend over a half million dollars in munitions to defend itself against Iran. The Biden administration, even after Congress approving additional funding for Israel, has been slow walking and, in this case, blocking munitions to Israel. What can you tell us? 
Yeah, it's completely and totally unacceptable. Right now, Israel is fighting for her life. It is imperative, I believe, both as Americans and for me as a Christian, that we stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. When you look at what this administration has done, they continue to undermine Israel's efforts in both being able to get at the hostages home, of which we cannot forget there are five American hostages outstanding in this group, and additionally, a radical hate Hamas. Hamas has said they would come back again and again and again until they absolutely annihilate the Jewish people. And this is a moment um, that unfortunately is going to stay with President Biden forever and that he is turning his back on our greatest ally in the Middle East and unfortunately it may have dire consequences. So we've got to continue to speak up and speak directly to this and make sure that Israel has what she needs to defend herself and to continue to thrive. Uh, Senator, are you concerned that this could have long-term implications for the relationship between the United States and Israel, which has been a longtime ally? Well, Tony, what I will say is you saw an overwhelming um, voice coming from Congress saying, we support Israel. We stand with Israel. So this is the Biden administration. This this lands solely on Joe Biden. He is giving in to the pro-Hamas wing of his party. He is looking forward to an election and thinking more about what's happening in Michigan and Minnesota than he is about actually creating a peaceful world and, and um, projecting peace through strength and, and what that means from the White Net with the White House. He has a continual doctrine of appeasement. You mentioned it when you were talking about Iran, but we can even look at the sanctions under President Trump and that regime. You, you look there and you look um, and what happened with the Iranian regime there versus what we're seeing under Joe Biden. The very same tools in the toolbox, but yet Iran continues to flourish from profits and oil revenue because this administration refuses to use the tools in their toolbox box to dry them up financially. And we know what they do with that money, Tony. They fund terrorism. They fund Hamas. They fund Hezbollah. They fund the Houthis. You mentioned it about attacking our troops almost 200 in time since October 7th. And when I visited Israel about two weeks after October 7th and landed there, it was an eerie feeling and that it was quiet and the streets were empty. And as we talked to those people on the ground and people in the Israeli government, they reminded us that Israel was created after the Holocaust so the Jewish people would never have to hide again. And now today is 79 years since VE Day when we actually liberated Europe from the grip of Nazi terror. And just on, on Monday was National Holocaust Remembrance Day where we remember the six million Jews who lost their life during the Holocaust. And it comes at a time, and listening to your entire programming, um, it comes at a time where we just have recent polls that say between the ages of 18 and 29 that one in five individuals in that age group believes the Holocaust did not occur. So this rise of anti-Semitism, um, the not standing with Israel, I think there are those of us in Congress that are going to continue to speak up, speak loudly, and use every tool in our toolbox to force this administration to do the right thing. And the right thing is to standing with Israel, allowing them to actually eradicate Hamas. That's what's best for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine, and um, find a find a path forward from there. Uh, Senator, I think you're correct. The Congress has spoken, spoken very loudly. Uh, we have an invitation coming from Congress to speak to to, to uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to speak to a joint session of Congress. And then I just saw just a few moments ago that uh, both uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson and the Senate. Uh, Republican leader Mitch McConnell have uh, issued a joint statement calling upon the administration to release those munitions to Israel. I, I want to ask you this question, Senator Britt. Do you think wh which is the Biden administration messaging to? Are they, uh, is this a message to the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, or is this a message for the left's radical base here in the United States? I think it's the left radical base. I mean, honestly, if you think about this, we let's talk about this. Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Democrats here in the Senate, 
went down to the Senate floor several weeks ago, and he called for a regime change there in Israel, obviously placating to his base. Now, if he was really worried about regime changes and wanted something that would actually create peace um, there in the Middle East, he would talk about a regime change in Iran, or he would talk about a, a regime change in other places. He would not focus that there on Israel. I mean, we could talk about a regime change in China or one in Russia. I mean, the list North Korea goes on and on and on, but yet he chose to go down and speak directly about the only democracy there in the Middle East. They are worried about voters. They see that President Trump is consistently rising in the polls. I mean, there is no doubt that he was the most pro-Israel president that we have ever had, and they are placating to a far left base. And the problem is um, when you're seeing what's happening across our country on our quote unquote elite and institution campuses and this administration refusing to unequivocally call it out. I mean, we should be able to call evil evil in this nation. And unfortunately, this president doesn't even have the gumption to do that. He needs to be making sure that we are enforcing Title VI, where our Jewish brothers and sisters feel safe going to class, feel safe in their living environment, feel safe studying in the library. Instead, he's allowing signs that say, kill the Jews, uh, go back to Poland, we are Hamas. Make no mistake, Hamas is a terrorist organization. And I also believe that anyone is here on a student visa that is advocating for this type of terrorism and is advocating for the genocide of the Jewish people needs to go home. And these institutions should not be federally funded and allowing this type of activity to occur. There is one thing is free speech. There is another thing that is action and action calling um, for the Jewish people to be put in harm's way is completely and totally unacceptable. And I will continue to speak out about that. As you should. It is unacceptable. Uh, very quickly, Senator Britt, switching topics, you, you, you've taken a very strong pro-life stand during your time in the Senate, and you've introduced a new initiative, More Opportunities for Moms to Succeed. Uh, tell us very quickly about that. Yeah, Tony. So I am so proud to be pro-life. And I believe that the Republican Party is the party of children, is the party of moms, is the party of parents. We are the party of families. And so this piece of legislation we are rolling out, I am really proud to work alongside Senators Rubio and Kramer to put a package together that supports moms on the pregnancy journey. So both the prenatal and uh, the postpartum phase and also early childhood phase. So making sure that resources are available, that um, you can go to pregnancy.gov and see all of the resources that are available in your area to help you in that journey, that it makes it easier in our rural communities for mothers um, to, to have telehealth visits um, during their prenatal journey and um, to really support that effort not only then, but but into the future, allowing um, more babies to be born, more mothers to be supportive, and more opportunities for families to grow. And Senator, that's exactly where the Republican Party should be, and that's where the Congress should be, supporting the unborn and their mothers, both, and the families that they live in. Senator Katie Brett, always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us and appreciate your leadership on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate being on. All right. Senator Katie Britt of Alabama. All right. After the break, Republicans in both chambers of Congress announced the, the introduction of uh, new legislation. Election integrity. Yes, it's needed. We're going to talk about it next with Texas Congressman Chip Roy when he joins us here on Washington Watch. So don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. In light of Israel's national security, global political and spiritual challenges, it is abundantly clear that the people of God must visibly demonstrate our unwavering support for Israel, support which is anchored in the Word of God. To do this, we're calling on and inviting Bible-believing Christians in every place of worship on Sunday, May 19th, to dedicate time to pray for Israel's peace, prosperity and protection. With thousands of churches and communities collectively raising their voice to the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel, this unified cry will serve as a powerful testament to the world of our shared belief and the importance of standing alongside the Jewish people. For more information, 
and to commit to praying for and standing with Israel on Sunday, May 19th, visit PrayAndStand.com. That's PrayAndStand.com for more information. score scripture in the Bible is this scripture, John 15 and 5, Jesus speaking, for without me, you can do nothing. This is not about sucking it up. It's not about pulling up your bootstraps. It's about turning from this to something, someone, and his name is Jesus, who enables us and empowers us to be the men of God that he's called us to be. Brothers, listen to me. You have been endowed with authority from heaven to put your hand up against all of the forces of darkness that is coming against you and against your household. And if you will use that rightful authority, God himself will stand in back of it. God has given you, as the parent, as the father of your children, the responsibility and the authority to teach your children. You are not to outsource that to your wife or to your pastor. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You will never be faithful in serving your calling if you're not faithful in your family relationships. It just won't happen. I don't need entertainment. I don't need opinions. I don't need a soft message. I need the Bible. I came to hear the Word of God today. That's what we need today, the Word of God. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Also, I want to remind you that on May the 19th, it is Pray For and Stand With Israel Sunday. And we are hoping to see churches all across this nation taking time on that Sunday morning just to pray for Israel and what is happening. Pray for peace for that entire country, every inch of it. And uh, you can join us in this effort. Simply text Israel to 67742. That's Israel to 67742. You'll get a link. Uh, you can sign the pledge as an individual that you'll pray for Israel. Or if you're a church, you can actually sign up your church. And uh, we hope to have thousands of churches across the country praying on May the 19th. Again, Israel to 67742. Uh, earlier today, House Speaker uh, Mike Johnson and Republicans from uh, both chambers of Congress announced the introduction of the SAVE Act, which will protect American voters and prevent illegal uh, immigrants from voting in federal elections. Now, reports indicate that uh, Senate Democrats will not advance this legislation, but with the upcoming elections this November prompting concerns of election integrity for many voters, and with some blue uh, states already moving to allow non-U.S. citizens to vote in local elections. Will the SAVE Act demonstrate which party prioritizes fair and free elections? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. The House is uh, voting. We're going to be uh, joined by phone here momentarily by Congressman Chip Roy of Texas. Uh, but before we, we do that, while we're waiting to connect with him, I, I want to bring in Travis Weber. Uh, Vice President for Policy here at the Family Research Council uh, to discuss another topic that we've been covering this week, and that is the anti-Semitism uh, issue that's been happening on college campuses across the nation. We're going to be talking about that next segment with uh, Senator Daines. But the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act that passed Congress last week, passed the House, now over in the Senate, has drawn criticism from the left and the right. And FRC has a resource available to help you navigate that. Travis, thanks so much for uh, joining me. Thank you, Tony. So uh, give us a, a quick rundown on the legislation and, uh, or, or rather the 
uh, the fact sheet that deals with the legislation where folks can get a copy of it. Yeah, so this um, is available at frc.org on our homepage at frc.org slash HR 6090 at the short link. Basically, the bill clarifies that anti-Semitism is something that can be addressed by the government under Title VI, which governs how federal funds should be spent on college campuses. So this is clear. It's clearly an issue that needs to be addressed, and it applies a certain definition of what that means. That's the simple matter. You know, there are some questions and concerns about free speech, but our resource addresses the context into which this issue is placed. And Tony, you know, this is crucial at this moment because yeah. of the need to stand with the Jewish people and everything they're facing. So we're here to do that with this resource. All right, folks, this kind of walks you through that. Uh, again, you can go to TonyPerkins.com and follow the links over. All right, Travis, uh, we may come back to this a little bit later, so uh, just stand by. I want to go to uh, to the House, where we have Congressman Chip Roy, as I mentioned earlier today, along with Speaker Mike Johnson, introduced the SAVE Act, which demonstrates which party prioritizes fair elections. Joining me now by phone is Congressman Chip Roy of Texas. Congressman, welcome back to uh, the program. Hey, Tony. Uh, great to be on the show. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. So I, I, I set the stage for this. Describe the, the, the legislation. But, you know, this shouldn't be necessary, but it is. Why is this so important? Well, as everyone knows who's been following the news, we've obviously had a uh, massive you know, assault on the rule of law and our well-being and safety and security in the United States, uh, deaths like Lake and Riley, all of the damage in Texas, $13 billion, all the stuff we all know. But the real uh, foundational problem with what's going on is that we're breaking down the rule of law, and particularly we're risking the very faith of elections that matter. Um, we do have laws on the books today, as you know, um, that requires that you be a citizen to vote. The problem is, is that uh, there are federal laws under motor, vote, motor voter that prohibit states from being able to check that and to ensure that only citizens are uh, uh, registered. And so this bill will clear that out and, in fact, go one step further, which is to require states uh, to re provide documentary proof of citizenship in order to register to vote. Uh, we allow some carve-outs and some things to be able to make it work for the secretaries of state to get it implemented. But largely, we got to make sure that there are no, uh, you know, uh, ways for them to end run it. And uh, and we need to make sure that only citizens vote. It's an 87 percent issue, Tony. Yeah. Um, and it's foundational to our faith in elections, our faith in our republic and democracy in this country. You know, th this year, Washington, D.C. passed a law allowing illegal immigrants to vote in all non-federal elections. I mean, number one. I mean, how do you make sure that they don't vote in the federal elections? And is this more of a like a trial balloon to try to normalize non-citizen voting? Well, I think there's a lot of that going on, right? And, and, you know, you've got such a division because of existing federal law. Arizona, for example, has two systems, one for their state elections where they require proof of citizenship. And then the federal system, where they're unable to provide uh, the proof of citizenship uh, requirement. Then you've got jurisdictions, as you just pointed out, like D.C. You've had some in California that have been encouraging non-citizens to register to vote and to vote in their local elections. Now, our bill wouldn't prohibit that. But what we would say is under the Constitution, con Congress has the authority and the power and, frankly, the responsibility to go in and to say, look, we're going to demand – that you prove citizenship if you're going to vote in federal elections. And states can work to make that work, and we give them the latitude to, to figure out how. But we demand that you have that documentary proof of citizenship in order to get in front of what we know is going to happen, radical states that are going to undermine our presidential elections and our congressional uh, uh, elections by allowing non-citizens to vote. Um, very quickly, an overwhelming majority of Americans support this, but news reports say that this bill is dead on arrival in the Senate. Why, why, why will Chuck Schumer not support this? Why wouldn't he support it? Well, well, you know, as my friend Senator Mike Lee said, I mean, I don't know that we should necessarily assume that yet. Um, you know, this is an 80-something, 87 percent issue. Uh, I'd like to see them vote. You know, let's have the vote. I think we should call the question. The goal here is to get Republicans, obviously in a very thin majority, to get this through the House. Hopefully some Democrats will join us for common sense. 
send it over to the Senate, and we'll see what happens. Um, the more the Democrats can demonstrate how out of touch they really are with virtually, you know, the, the vast majority of Americans, then look, that'll that'll be clear in the election. Yeah. But this isn't a messaging bill. This is something that we believe ought to be law and ought to be law immediately. Well, it's so needed. We'll just see whether Democrats are serious or not. Yeah, it's it's definitely needed. Congressman Chip Roy, we're out of time, but uh, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tony. God bless. All right. All right. Coming up next, police here in D.C. cleared out a pro-Hamas encampment at George Washington University. We talk about it. Don't go away. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a Holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Welcome back to Washington Watch, the website TonyPerkins.com. Again, if you'd like to join us on May the 19th to stand with and pray for Israel, text Israel to 67742. All right, early this morning, Washington, D.C. police cleared an encampment of uh, pro-Hamas protesters at George Washington University, arresting 33 people after a weeks-long holdout that had campus officials repeatedly calling on local law enforcement for help. Now, this came just hours before both Washington's mayor and police chief were scheduled to testify before the House Oversight Committee to explain their lack of action against the uh, pro-Hamas encampment. Now, that hearing was subsequently canceled after officials moved on the encampment. Joining me now to discuss this, Senator Steve Daines from Montana who uh, crossed town to visit the encampment this week before it was cleared out. He serves on four Senate committees, including the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. Senator Daines, welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to see you. Good to see you, too, Tony. So you went over to the encampment uh, yesterday. What did you, uh, what'd you encounter? Yeah, Tony, actually what happened is I left Montana early yesterday morning on my commute back to Washington. I landed at the Reagan Airport, and my team picked me up and took me to the George Washington campus. Uh, what I saw yesterday was reprehensible. The statue of George Washington covered in stickers that say Free Palestine, that said From the River to the Sea, there's a Palestinian flag wrapped around George Washington. He, they have a Palestinian flag replacing an American flag, you know, carrying in his hand. Uh, his head was covered in a kafia, you know, the, the black and white checkered uh, scarf, face wrapped in that. It, it was just horrible. And then there was a, a whiteboard, a large whiteboard at the base of that statue that basically laid out the encampment rules of these you know, this pro-Hamas encampment. 
And the first thing it said in big block letters, number one, no Zionism, stop Zionism. And oh, by the way, somebody had taken a can of red spray paint and vandalized the George Washington statue and said genocide on there. So, I mean, Tony, this is in the United States of America, in our nation's capital, a statue of George Washington. And by the way, surrounding that statue was the encampment. So that encampment of these pro-Hamas anti-Semites was using the George Washington statue as ground zero. Yeah, sir, it was no Valley Forge, that's for sure. Uh, let, let me ask you this question, Senator Daines. What do you attribute all of this to? Well, you know, Tony, I, I had uh, thoughtful conversations while I was there on the GW campus, seeing that you know the darkness of what's going on with those uh, those encamped. But then I also walked two blocks away to the Hillel Center, which is the Jewish Student Center. I had a chance to meet a wonderful uh, conservative rabbi, Rabbi Steiner. We had a, a wonderful exchange of words and actually an embrace when we were done. They're so appreciative of members of Congress standing up on behalf of the Jewish people and on behalf of Israel. But then I met with a group of Jewish students who told me they were afraid to walk on campus. Uh, they're scared just being in classes and, and, and being what should be normal college life. But we talked about this issue. Where is it coming from? And you know, one, one thing we talked about is this is not a new problem. This goes back 4,000 years, certainly, of, of anti-Semitism, the hatred towards you know, God's chosen people, the Jews. Uh, and it, it manifests itself every so often in history in kind of graphic form. You're thinking about what happened in the 1930s and the rise of uh, Nazis in Germany. Uh, it, so it, it's, it's not a new problem, Tony, but it's right here now in America in a way that I've not seen in my lifetime spreading like a bad disease across campuses. And I look at the doctrine, the ideologies, this poisonous thing is being taught right now at our universities. They, they right. talk about diversity and inclusion. Well, that's as long as it, there's included in that doctrine of hatred for Jews. It's just the, the, the darkness and so, the evil front of this so let ideology. Me, let me ask you about the, this manifestation that you said that that does occur. History shows us it occurs from time to time, but usually it comes when there is a vacuum of biblical morality and presence. When, when Christianity is actually Bible, Bible-based Christianity has been the greatest protector of the Jewish people. But when that Christian worldview is removed, it is filled with what you said goes way back to the very beginning. Tony, I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, when we were having the discussions about uh, supplying Israel with more lethal aid to defend itself, uh, I was having discussions with many of my, my Jewish friends. I was one of the, the last senators to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu in Jerusalem prior to the October 7th attack. I was with Bibi there on August 29th and 30th, and we talked about Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. But what I told my friends who are advocating strongly for Israel, as I do, as you do, as we do, as believers, is that in some ways at this moment in history, I'm more worried about America than I am about yeah. Israel because you know, Israel has been around for 4,000 years, and God's promise to Israel was unconditional. He moved in and chose them unconditionally. And in, in Genesis 12, 3, in the call of Abraham and so forth, yeah, the, it says, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse right. you. So our side of that, of that covenant is conditional. You're absolutely Israel right. It's is unconditional. And so I worry more about, you know, we're a 248-year experiment. Israel's 4,000 years, and that's I, why I'm concerned. I agree with you, Senator, but we've got to leave it there. We're out of time. Always great to see you. Folks, stick with us. We're back after this. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We're in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, 
Millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. Between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give. Jesus said in John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in Him through His Word. At Family Research Council, we wanna help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in Him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sagecon, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sagecon, to learn more. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you uh, with us on this Wednesday. If you would like to join us as we counter the darkness of these pro-Hamas pro protests that are occurring on university campuses across the country, we're actually going to pray and stand with Israel on May the 19th. And, and, and we're going to be praying for the peace of the entire land. And that's everybody who lives there. We want peace for everybody. If you'd like to join us, on that Sunday, May the 19th, text Israel to 67742. That's 67742. You'll get a link. You can actually sign the pledge to pray. If you're a church, you can sign up and uh, join hundreds of others, other churches that are praying on that day, May the 19th. Our word for today comes from Judges chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim that took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, this is a phrase we see repeatedly. In those days when there was no king. What did that mean? Well, there was no king, no authority. There was no order. It was anarchy. Judges reveals that spiritual compromise leads to moral corruption, which ushers in cultural chaos and then eventually political tyranny. This is one of my concerns with the libertarian political movement that is attracting the support of many Christians today. Order requires morality. President George Washington made that understanding clear in his farewell address to the nation. He said, quote, of all of the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And then he went on to warn and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion, end quote. In other words, morality has no foundation without religion, and to be specific, Christianity. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, text BIBLE to 67742. That's BIBLE to 67742. All right, this just in, just a few moments ago, 
Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene moved to force a vote on ousting House Speaker Mike Johnson. Now, uh, this move comes after two days of uh, listening sessions and conversations that the Speaker has had uh, with her and a couple of others. This will trigger within the next two days a vote on whether to vacate the chair. Now, it's already been stated that the Democrats uh, will not entertain. Uh, in fact, right now there is a motion to table, uh, and it, uh, that appears to be moving in the right direction. Uh, it looks like it will be tabled, and this will be uh, behind the speaker. Uh, so that actually could be a positive outcome. Uh, we're sure to be talking about that uh, tomorrow on the broadcast when we get more information. Well, uh, also on Capitol Hill today, not quite as uh, explosive, but still interesting, a House subcommittee on education and the workforce grilled elementary and high school administrators today on the rising occurrences of anti-Semitism in elementary school, all right, in high school. Now, we're not talking college campuses. We're talking about the little kids, the fact that they're being indoctrinated with anti-Semitism? Wow, that, that's shocking. So what do we learn from today's hearing, and how pervasive is this? Well, joining me now to discuss this is uh, Meg Kilgannon. She's all things education. She is our senior fellow for education studies here at the Family Research Council. She served in the Department of Education during the Trump administration. Meg, welcome back. Good to be back. You know what? You're going to get your own name card right there. <laughs> you, you were here yesterday. So what did we, uh, we learn from uh, today? Well, I appreciated what the uh, committee was trying to do today. It was trying to explain, you know, we just had the segment with Senator Daines on what's going on in college campuses. And it's important, I think, for Americans to understand that this doesn't happen when kids get to college. It certainly can happen when, when kids get to college. But the foundation is laid in high school and in elementary school as well. Where is that coming from? The, the fact that we are um, in many ways a post-religious America, unfortunately, and the fact that the, you, the, the elementary schools and high schools are using an oppressor-oppressed so kind this of is a part paradigm. of the Marxist, the Marxist Absolutely. ideology. Absolutely. So is this, I don't know if you heard my conversation with Senator Daines a few moments ago. You should be, because every yeah. good American is listening to me when I'm talking about the, the whole thing. So the, the, the reality is that this vacuum that's created by pushing God out of the public square is going to be filled by something else. It's filled by something much worse. Right. right. And that's what's giving rise to this darkness. Absolutely. And so the, that was the point that they were hoping to get across today at this hearing is that, that we can't, we, we need to focus on colleges, right? But we also need to understand that so, younger it, children are being brainwashed in these ways Well, and that well. was a part of my conversation last week with the speaker was that this was an all of Congress effort because you have to expose the tentacles of this anti-Semitism. What we're seeing is a manifestation on college campuses, but as you just said, it starts way before that. Right. And it, it, it sometimes it's explicitly anti-Semitic. Right. Other times it is more general or, in nature. Or it's just tilling the ground. Yes. Preparing for those seeds of anti-Semitism to be planted. Right. Uh, it, it, it's that that I'm so glad that we had the video footage of the statue of George Washington there uh, in right. that segment before, because <clears throat> it's just shocking to see that. But and to know that that's happening two blocks from the White House. Here's what I, I, I want people to hear on this. Cause this is just one issue. It's a big issue. It, it matters a lot to me because I think it as as uh, Senator Daines talked about, I agree with him 100 percent. And I, and I said this when I had my meeting with the prime minister, that I believe America's future is intertwined with Israel. Israel has a future. It's promised in scriptures, a Bible believing Christian. I believe that. America is uncertain. And, and I believe given that we've walked away from biblical truth, the one thing that has God's hand of protection, I, I think, upon this nation is because we've been a protector of Israel. We walk away from that. I'm not certain about our future. But that said, we need to be aggressive, aggressive, all right? Aggressive is what I just said. I used the word aggressive in spreading the gospel and encouraging Christians to live out their faith. What I mean by that 
it's time to be bold. It's time to be courageous because we're now seeing the fruit of our being complicit with the, the, the idea that there was supposed to be some kind of neutrality right. in the public space. There is no such thing as neutrality. No, I think that's right. And the, the proof of that is the fact that when we have any sort of quasi-neutral space, it's, it's not neutral, right? No. The, in fact, in horrible things well, are flooding into that well, space, and Jesus filling said, that look, vacuum. Jesus said, either you're for me or against me. Either you're gathering with me or you're scattering. So th this idea that there's some kind of this despiritualized zone that, you know, we go into in public is, it is a lie of the enemy. Now, I've never bought into that, but I'm, I'm saying this for the benefit of those who think that, well, you know, we just need this moral neutrality. There is no such thing as moral neutrality. And what we see happening on college campuses, what is now working its way into the hearts and minds of young people across this country is evil taking advantage of that idea that there can be moral neutrality. And if we believe we have the truth, we shouldn't be ashamed to share it. We should be very proud and, in fact, honor-bound to do so. Right, right. The truth, it is the truth that will set us free. And so I, my appeal to, uh, to believers all across this country is to, to pray, you know, to vote, and to stand, to be bold in our standing for the truth. As you said, we have no reason to apologize. Now, people may be offended by that, but that's on them. Now, I will say, also say, I do not think we should be offensive in our conduct. Uh, we share the truth out of, a, out of a love for others so that they might come to know the truth, yes. find the purpose and meaning that life has when we're in relationship with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And... Public education is not off limits to the truth. For sure it isn't. If public education, the good of the public is to have the truth. That is, that is the, the point, right? And so I, I think that when we want to, we, we love our country and we want to enjoy its blessings and have our children enjoy the blessings of this nation, we have to be ready to stand. Right. And to, to proclaim that what is true. Final question for you, um, Meg. You know, you've been tracking education. You're in the Department of Education. We, we saw the silver lining from COVID, parents more aware. Is this more, could this be, could this be, as people see the evil that has begun to manifest itself, could this be a booster rocket for parents and others to to, to move in and begin to influence education even more? I certainly hope so. The opportunity is, he, is here. Um, the need has never been greater. And so I hope that people will take, their, take this opportunity to really engage in their communities and most especially engage with your own children. Yeah. Make sure they know the faith yeah. and make sure they're not afraid to share that, it either. That's, that's biblical. It's, it's exactly what God told us to do. Meg Kilgannon, always great to see you. It's great to see you, Tony. Thanks so much for uh, keeping up on that stuff and keeping us filled in. Well, folks, I encourage you to, uh, to teach your children, show them who God is, what he has done, and what he expects of each and every one of us. All right, this just in, the House has voted to table the resolution to remove House Speaker Mike Johnson. So... The motion to vacate push fo put forward by Marjorie Taylor Greene has been uh, canned. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will take the spotlight off of her and she can uh, go back to doing whatever she was doing before. Uh, but hopefully the House will be able to move forward now with uh, the work that needs to be done uh, without this being a daily discussion item. Uh, joining me now to, uh, to wrap this up and to go back to our discussion on the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, Travis Weber, Vice President of Policy here at the Family Research Council. Travis, a fluid program today with a lot happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, any additional uh, thoughts or comments on the motion uh, to vacate that was just tabled by the House? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Tony, that was a quick process. And, um, you know, I think we, we have this behind us now where Speaker Johnson is you know, it's an affirmation of him as House leader, uh, and, and he's in his post. So. Well, he uh, he and I talked about this uh, earlier in the week, and uh, you know, the idea was to immediately move to this and not 
the, the motion required it to be voted on within two days. I think some thought that it would hang out there for two days, giving them an opportunity to be in the limelight and message on it. Uh, and I think he made the right move by uh, moving to table it immediately and putting this behind the House. Uh, let's go to some of the issues um, that critics have been hitting on. One of them is just what we were just talking about right here with, uh, with Meg. Anti-Semitism Awareness Act that passed the House last week. It's pending before the Senate. This is language that has been in place since the Trump administration by executive order in December of 2019 put across all federal agencies. Um, the State Department has had this language since 2016. Why all of a sudden is it a problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder the answer to that question. There's no logical reason it should suddenly be a problem, because this largely takes what's already in the Trump administration's executive order, places it in statute, and says, here's Congress's voice on the matter. And if there's ever a time we need Congress's voice on this matter, we need it now. We're in a different world post-October 7th, and these events, this vote, this bill cannot be examined out of that context, the attack on October 7th, the United States abstaining with the Security Council in late March, Iran attacks, and you look at what's happening in campuses, right. we need to stand with the Jewish people. This is crucial. Two big issues here that people, critics, raised. On. Number one is that it criminalizes the gospel. Yeah. We addressed that in our newly released resource here. Available, available at frc.org slash hr6090 on the homepage as well. And First off, this is not criminal. It does not it, criminalize. It, it, it's, no. it's actually a civil statute, so it doesn't even deal with criminal it, law. It doesn't. You know, and unfortunately, it's taken off online. It's not the place to base your full examination or opinion on the matter. You know, we encourage folks to read the bill. We kind of review the bill and, and different issues in this fact sheet, but... Uh, to answer the question, no, it does not address criminal law. It does not uh, contravene the First Amendment. It provides for this definition to, of anti-Semitism to be used in Title VI federal funding matters and determinations of whether there has been ethnic, uh, national origin, or racial discrimination by a higher ed education institution. That's been around for decades. And it never was clear whether anti-Semitism could be categorized under ethnic discrimination. So since the Bush administration, for decades since then, they have said, look, um, anti-Semitism can be classified here. What this does is has this definition of anti-Semitism since 2019, which has been in the Trump administration executive order, it uses that definition, puts it in statute. The reason that's important is it doesn't let people off the hook by saying, I'm criticizing Israel. I have vitriol directed against Israel, but I'm not anti-Semitic because uh, I'm just criticizing Israel. This definition is important because it ties anti-Semitic um, action and attitudes to uh, the, the nation of Israel. And, and if you go after the nation of Israel because it is Jewish, as a Jewish homeland, this is capturing the truth of right. anti-Semitism. And that's, that's very important. And over a thousand jurisdictions have used this very same definition and there's not been one case of what the the opponents of this say has happened where the gospel has been criminalized or silenced. Yeah, it's out there. It's been used. It's over 30 states, uh, 70 municipalities in the United States, uh, many nations around the world. So, you know, but Tony, I think it's important if we look at the, um, the, the issue here, we understand people, look, we want to affirm the First Amendment, right. but the context here, it's not the concern that's being articulated in social media. It's important that folks understand that, and it's important we look at this in the moment that we're right. in. Travis Weber, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Folks, and you can get a copy of that. Go to TonyPerkins.com under the episode resources for today. We're out of time. Until next time, I leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, Washington keep standing. Washington Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234. 
372-7234. 